The seventh commandment is, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Lord's Day 41 of the Heidelberg Catechism states regarding this, What doth the seventh commandment teach us? That all uncleanness is accursed of God, and that therefore we must with all our hearts detest the same, and live chastely and temperately, whether in holy wedlock or in single life. Doth God forbid in this commandment only adultery and such like gross sins? Since both our body and soul are temples of the Holy Ghost, he commands us to preserve them pure and holy. Therefore, he forbids all unchaste actions, gestures, words, thoughts, desires, and whatever can entice men thereto. From our previous three sermons on the Seventh Commandment and Lord's Day 41, we can draw some key ideas. First, and in general, there are two main systems of sexual ethics in the West. The first is that of the world, which is promiscuous and licentious, promoting various sorts of sexual immorality, and yet also extremely self-righteous and virulently denying anyone who dares suggest even that their own ethics are corrupt and filthy. And second, the other main system of sexual ethics is God's. Summed in the seventh commandment, Expanded here in Lord's Day 41 and taught in various shapes and forms and ways throughout the whole scriptures. Two main systems of ethics. Reject the first in its entirety and go with the second. And secondly, we have seen over the past few weeks that people could be said to hold a twofold identity. There's a word for you. Gender identity is either male or female, nothing in between or nothing to either side of male or female. It is assigned at conception and given with God's creation and in providence. And we're not now referring to an extremely tiny percentage of people who are Intersex. That's not what we're touching upon now. We're talking about the 99.9% where everything's really crystal clear. We are in this room either male or female. So is everybody else. And then too, we have our spiritual identity. These are the key lenses with which we look at ourselves in the world. We're either believers or unbelievers, children of God or children of the devil. We must know ourselves to be what God says we are in his works of creation and redemption. Two main systems of ethics. A twofold identity. And last week we looked at the two virtuous, holy and wonderful states of singleness and married life. And you're either one or the other there too. We're into what we might call binaries today. Just one or the other. A or B. One or two. And we're going to bring up these three foundational principles and ideas at appropriate points through the sermon and show how these things are key to biblical thinking and living. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 states, This is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. The big word there is sanctification. Holiness in us, and therefore holiness in our lives. And sanctification is what God approves of and what God is pleased with 
And then believers, this is the context, we can even say that sanctification is what God desires or wishes or wants earnestly. And therefore, sanctification is what God works in us. Because when he wants something, he sets about achieving it. That being said about sanctification, I want to stress that 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 teaches that issues pertaining to the seventh commandment are a huge part of sanctification. Notice what it says. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. And from that point, the apostle could have gone on to talk about all sorts of things. He could have talked about how you deal with God's holy name or how you relate to your neighbor or your employer or this aspect of your life or that aspect. But what he says is, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that, and it's almost as if this is the whole of it, though it's not, that ye should abstain from fornication. Fornication and sanctification are here diametrically opposed. You're either going one way or the other way, and you can't really have both. Sanctification has this chunk on the seventh commandment because of the pagan environment around us in the world. Paul goes on to say in verse 5, this is the will of God, your sanctification. Verse 5, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. And here the idea is if someone doesn't have the knowledge of God, they're practically bound to go into fornication. Because that's the only thing that can keep anybody from it. If somebody doesn't know who God is, the Creator, they're bound to be stuck pretty much in fornication. And that is indeed what happens all around the world. And that is the secular, ungodly culture. (coughs) Ours too. The seventh commandment is vital in sanctification, not only because of the pagan environment, that is the world, but because of the old man of the unbeliever. Sanctification involves the putting to death of the old man, that's the negative side, and the quickening of the new man, the positive side, and that old man needs to be put to death in the light of the seventh commandment because it is filled with lusts, all sorts of unholy desires, which encompass all sorts of things, and here now especially sexual lusts. Let's look this evening at the seventh commandment and our affections. Our affections. What we like, dislike, what we warm to, what interests us, what attracts us. The seventh commandment and our affections. First, we'll consider detesting uncleanness. And second, no overreaching. It's a bit unclear at this stage, but you'll see later on. Detesting uncleanness and no overreaching. The first point then is detesting uncleanness. And even that word detesting seems perhaps a bit strong. Detesting. And even, and this damns it in the 21st century, a bit old fashioned. Is anything old fashioned? Anything for the past is practically gone, useless, scrap it. It sounds a bit judgmental to detest something. And the world tells us that it actually sounds unchristian because the world lectures us these days about what Christianity is, even though it hasn't got the foggiest notion what Christianity is. And it sounds too, detesting does, intolerant. And if there's anything worse than being intolerant, it must be really bad. Those are the contemporary buzzwords which are designed and always seem to have the effect of making what God says in his word seem dodgy and bad and something to be rejected. But when we speak about detesting uncleanness, this is not too strong. Of course it's not too strong. Uncleanness, and here we're dealing with sexual uncleanness, is sin. Ah, and what is our attitude to sin? 
Are we in the church neutral towards sin? Do we think that sin is something a wee bit on the wrong side of the, of the neutral? Sort of in the bad side. Slightly bad. Or very negative. Or is it not the case that sin for a Christian is to be detested and hated and loathed? And is it not the case that the Bible... <coughs> I've been reading Ezekiel recently. As some of you have been reading the Bible program. The Bible's filled with hating and detesting and loathing sin. Yeah, that's not too strong. That's the right word. The very word. The choicest of words. And the Reformed faith, here in answer 108, says this is the way we're to view this. This is the ethical, emotional, effective state Detest. Regarding uncleanness, answer 118 states that we must, with all our hearts, detest the same. That's the reformed word and that's credo. What doth the seventh commandment teach us? If it teaches us anything, Lord's Day 41 goes on to answer, it teaches us this. That all uncleanness is accursed of God. There, crystal clear. And that therefore we must with all our hearts detest the same. That's a totally different world from the sort of stuff you read in magazines and get on, on, on TV and in the news. Totally different world. All uncleanness is accursed of God. Therefore, we must with all our hearts detest the same. This teaches us that the curse of God is upon all uncleanness. And the preposition upon means it's over it, resting down upon it. So here's the idea. The fornication of single people, say older teenagers and young adults, the curse of of God rests upon the whole field. The adultery of married people has hovering above it, as it were, God's curse. Divorce, for any other ground than the one ground that God gives in Scripture, sexual immorality, that's a curse. It isn't just, oh, my cousin couldn't get on with his or her wife or husband. And I'm afraid they've had to break up. Not to say that you can't even state it like that. But ethically, this is what happened. It's under the curse. Because I am the Lord who hate divorce. Malachi 2. Remarriage, while one's spouse is living, the curse of God is upon that. The home is cursed. But the two of them are set up. Isn't that wonderful? The two of them. And he's found another wife. And, and he's happy again. And we're so pleased for you. No, the whole thing's under God's curse. That's what scripture teaches. Prostitution and whoremongering. A curse it. Sodomy and lesbianism. Isn't something to be endorsed. And proclaimed as the most beautiful. Instance of love ever seen under the sun. No. It's cursed. That's what the seventh commandment tells us. If it's wrong, as Jesus says it is, to lust after another woman with your eyes, well then for two men or two women to do this, that's cursed. This curse of God is upon the unclean places which befoul our cities in the red light districts and upon the city perhaps in all the world that is extolled as most virtuous, the centre of entertainment, the joy of the whole earth, Hollywood, it's a cursed place filled with fornication, adultery, and sodomy. It makes a fortune, though. Yeah, sin is a way of making a fortune. The pornography industry, with its websites and magazines and videos, including the participants, the producers, and the consumers, the whole industry and movement, is under the curse of God. Hebrews 13 verse 4. 
puts the two sides of the truth very clearly. Marriage, it's honourable in all. And the bed, undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. The text that Hugh Latimer passed on to King Henry VIII. But he didn't lose his head for it. Henry was in a better mood than usual that day and didn't have him executed. God's judgment is the curse. The curse upon them in this life by giving them over more and more onto their sin. And the curse in the next life in the form of everlasting hell. Unless they repent and cease doing these works. And know blessedness in Jesus Christ who was cursed for us on the cross. When he bore our sins on his own body on the tree. And God even makes abusers of the seventh commandment feel their uncleanness. That's a striking word. Uncleanness. Those who engage in uncleanness feel, to whatever extent and whatever time, despite all their denials, they feel dirty. They feel filthy. If you're playing sport, let's say, in a mucky field in the winter, you're filthy. You get covered in dirt. Not that it's any massive problem, although it may be to your mother if you come into the living room like that. But you are dirty, and therefore you feel dirty. I've got muck all over me. Well, the people who engage in these sins against the seventh commandment, because they are sexually unclean, feel. God makes them feel dirty and filthy. They feel, though they're never going to admit this, they feel that their hands with which they engage in these actions and their eyes and their bodies are dirty. They feel like they need a shower, but like Lady Macbeth with the blood on her hands trying to wash it clean. They drove her man. Because of the pangs of a guilty conscience, God does not leave himself without a witness, a witness inside people condemning them as a harbinger of the final judgment. And this truth helps us, beloved, because it reassures us that the wicked, with regard now to the seventh commandment, will not get away with it. And that's good to know. That's not vindictiveness. It's simply a matter of justice. The judge of all the earth will do right. He will deal with this. Those who promote sexual uncleanness and so make money out of it and thereby serve to pollute further society, they're under God's curse. They ought to know that. And they do know that. And their feet shall slide in due time. The anti-Christian sexual activists who not only love their sin, but see enshrining these things in laws as a way to get at the church and attack Christians, their judgment is coming too. It has already come. These are the people who deceive society by calling evil good and unclean clean. Isaiah 5 deals with this very sin. These are the people who pr- pressurize folk to legislate and enforce <coughs> sexual debauchery so that those who oppose, especially sodomy and lesbianism, that these people are marginalized, are silenced, are sacked, are sued. And we've only seen the beginning of it. And everyone knows that these are the things likely to happen, especially if they are public about it. That they will fear being marginalized, silenced, sacked, or sued. Because they're so tolerant. And the good news is that we don't have to get up in arms or solve the social evils of our world, which can't actually be done in this life. We're looking for the cataclysmic second coming of Jesus Christ. The good news for us is that God takes care of this. That he is not mocked. That the wicked shall be cast into hell. And the standing example of this is God's raining down of fire and brimstone upon Sodom and Gomorrah. As a standing lesson 
of God's attitude towards us. But the wicked mock that, just as they mock the flood, just as they mock hell. Because they don't want it to be true. This also helps us too, beloved, with regard to the sexual criminals who escape prosecution in this life to know that they are being judged by God and will be punished in the lake of fire. And here we think of the sex traffickers, the rapists, and the pedophiles. Those people who bring such destruction to their victims, especially women and children, and the very people for whose nefarious sakes, especially women and children, have to take extra precaution and the people about whom parents are concerned with respect to their children and with respect to grandchildren. God has their number. <coughs> and shall not the judge of all the earth do right? But probably more importantly for us this evening, the truth that God curses all uncleanness helps us regarding our own sinful inclinations. It helps us, first of all, to label them properly so that we know what we're dealing with. It's not some sort of affair, which word of itself sounds rather pleasant. The world is amazing ways of, of making sin sound wonderful. It's not just pornography. It's not just homosexuality. The whole thing Here's the big brush stroke with one of those 12 inch brushes. The whole thing, splash it, uncleanness. It's filthy. That's what it is. And this helps us too to understand what God immutably and righteously thinks of it. A curse it. This whole endeavour, this whole activity, this whole field, a curse it. Because all uncleanness is a curse of God. And helps us then respond to it correctly in terms of our emotions or affections. Not merely, well, I don't like that. That's not for me. Or I don't like it a lot. Or I strongly dislike it. But I detest uncleanness. That's what must be in our hearts. I detest it. I detest it with all my heart. And I detest all uncleanness, not just the really gross bits that even some people in the world don't like, but I detest all uncleanness with all my heart. Wow. That's what the Catechism says. God is a way of requiring impossible things from us, completely impossible of the flesh. What doth the seventh commandment teach us? What's it all about? That all uncleanness is a curse of God. And that therefore we must, with all our hearts, detest the same. That's what the seventh commandment teaches us. That's what God was doing when he wrote with his finger the seventh commandment on the tables of stone in the book of Exodus. <coughs> Let me give you some examples. Think of Joseph with Potiphar's wife. I alluded to this earlier in connection with Psalm 105. She asked him, brazen hussy that she was, married woman too, lie with me. And the man fled. He fled with this question on his lips and in his heart, how can I do this evil? Not merely against her husband, but against God. How can I do this great evil against God? And what Joseph is saying, in effect, is Lord's Day 41. This woman wants him to lie with her. All uncleanness is a curse of God. I detest it with all my heart. And he fled. And he fled from her as if someone today saw a man with a bucket of acid that he was about to throw over him and you get out of there. Because that acid can ruin you. He fled. He detested that uncleanness. There was a man. 
who had it right in his heart, then was put in that difficult position by this woman, and he didn't waver because God was with him. He was an incredibly godly young man. And if someone seeks to seduce us, or you see a lascivious image on your computer or your iPhone, the right response is, I detest that sort of thing. That's hard. Hard to get to that spiritual level by the grace of God. This is filthy. This is uncleanness. And this whole thing is under God's curse. What do I want with that? And you realise, of course, that the commandment, which always drives at the heart here, is telling us, you must keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it are all the issues of life. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And therefore you must love your neighbour as yourself. This is the deepest problem that all of us have regarding all sin and here specifically the seventh commandment. That not merely it's are we giving way to certain (coughs) lusts but we're not loving the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our strength and with all our might. Unlike Joseph. And that's why we have a long way to go with the new obedience. And this is what we mean by detesting uncleanness in Lord's Day 41. Now we're going to turn to no overreaching. And that's especially from 1 Thessalonians 4, where verse 6 says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter because that the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also have forewarned you and testify that no man go beyond that no man overreach and the going beyond and overreaching here in the context is dealing with the seventh commandment. That no one goes beyond or overreaches in sexually ethical issues. And if you refer to going beyond or overreaching, you are employing boundaries. There are limits. There are invisible, but nonetheless completely real, or all that, boundaries between a married man and a woman married to a different man. There are boundaries. And I'm just saying what everybody here knows and takes for granted. There are boundaries between a married man and a single woman. There are boundaries between two single people of the opposite gender. Boundaries that shouldn't be crossed. There are boundaries between an adult and a child such that a grown man shouldn't think all day about and become besotted with some teenage girl. There are boundaries. And these boundaries include all sorts of things such as space or location. Boundaries between these parties are especially significant around places like bathrooms, like bedrooms, <coughs> boundaries. These boundaries include physical issues too, like being alone together, or being physically close, too close physically. And these boundaries, as all of you will understand, are hard to spell out, especially in part of a sermon. Where do you put the boundaries exactly between two people at a certain time and in a certain place and all the rest? But with the boundaries, here to think of a line, you can also helpfully think about a bell. There are warning bells. She is not his spouse. What are they doing together? 
Why are they so close? Why are they alone? That man spends too much time with and too much attention upon those girls. He's a married man. That's not appropriate. Boundaries. Everybody knows there are these boundaries. And it needs to be said too because the world around us is talking about boundaries. In terms of these sexual things. It sows the wind and it reaps the whirlwind. Pornography everywhere. And so particularly disgusting sexual things are going on today. And everybody's hearing about it. You can't not hear about it. It brings up the area about going beyond boundaries. What is appropriate and what is not. And I'll explain in a minute why this is so important for Christians. Boundaries. And what's very disturbing is when someone appears to have little or no sense of the boundary. A very bad sign. Either the person's incredibly naive or very stupid. How did all this pass them by? Is it really possible that that woman doesn't know these boundaries or that guy? Or is this just a ruse in the day's debased world you need to be careful. Is this just a ruse to pretend not to be aware of boundaries in order to feed one's lusts? And one of the things that pornography does is it smashes boundaries. It gives people warped views of relationships of men and women. And then people say, well, this is a softer sort of thing. It doesn't really matter. It's that other stuff that's bad. But Jesus rules the whole thing out when he says, you're not allowed even to lust after a woman. Don't give me soft or hard. That, that's a world here you're in the wrong ethics. <laughs> you're in the wrong ethics. That's the world system. Sin is looking after a woman to lust after her. Don't talk about that soft. You, if you shift it out of biblical ethics to that stuff, you're the wrong standard. You're going, your whole thing is going to be wrong. You don't yield to that. You don't start that because sin, sin conceives and then grows and then that and then kills. That's what sin does. You don't try for it. But this issue of going beyond boundaries, referred to in First Thessalonians four verse six, going beyond boundaries regarding the seventh commandment, is an issue too regarding the church. And this is sadly and painfully evident in both further or more recent history and history further down the centuries in various churches, especially in the false churches, but also to some extent in true churches, where you hear the wretched scenarios where a minute by a minister commits adultery, or the Roman priests sexually abusing boys for decades and centuries and you say that's all very sleazy well yeah it is it is it's unclean it's unclean isn't that what the bible says it doesn't the bible refer to an attempted homosexual gang rape in Gibeah in the old testament church with the tribe of benjamin and that was followed by a gang rape of a woman that's in the church. An extremely wicked, apostatizing church. It happens in the church. History tells us that. Recent and more ancient. And one reason for this too is Satan who hates Jesus Christ. And Revelation 12 teaches us that since he can no longer get at Christ because he has ascended into heaven, he attacks the church, the bride of Christ. And this is a very good way in the 21st century to destroy and ruin the church. Because in part, because the world is so debauched, it tries to set some sort of a boundary as to really bad behavior and then throw everything it can at it. Imagine if something like that happened here. What a disgrace. What a shame. How awful. Another factor too is the membership of the church. False churches are going to be liable to this too because 
they're filled with unbelievers. Their office bearers are unbelievers. The people in the pew are unbelievers. They've rejected the gospel. And even in true churches, there are some who are reprobate, who are hypocrites. And even of the true believers, there is the old nature of the imperfectly sanctified sin. Besides all of that, this is the bit that First Thessalonians 4 brings up. There's something about the church as a community of love that can, in certain warped circumstances, provide an opening for this sort of thing. In the church we say, love one another. You're all brothers and you're all sisters. And perhaps because of this, there are those who are filled with sexual lust who think that they can get away with more. People have their guards down in Christian scenarios. And this is the backdrop for 1 Thessalonians 3. We read verse 12. The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Chapter 4, verse 9, But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia. And we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. And in the middle of those two scriptures that I read, verse 6 says, Watch out that no man go beyond. I'm so loving, I can see how it goes. And defraud his brother in any matter. The Lord is the avenger of such. Because the love of God and the love which is exhorted here in 1 Thessalonians doesn't overturn the key areas and key distinctions we mentioned at the start of the sermon. By all means, love one another, but stick to the scriptural system of sexual ethics, not the world. By all means, love one another, but remember that there are two states, singleness, and you have to be chaste and temperate in your singleness, or holy marriage, and you have to be chaste and temperate in your holy matrimony, and you are to love only one man or one woman in that special, exclusive sense. And no matter what love we have for each other, we don't go beyond and use that as an excuse. First Thessalonians 4 verse 6 says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Going beyond boundaries. Here's a boundary you hear a lot of today. Groping. And groping is as forbidden as shoplifting. A wicked use of the hands. And just as with shoplifting, that thing does not belong to you. You're not entitled to it. Don't really care for the word entitled myself. But if you buy something in the shop, you are entitled to it. You can bring that home. It's yours. And if you're married, I don't like the word entitled here, it doesn't fit. But you know, that person, you're one flesh. That's different. But apart from that, there's no entitlement at all in this area. Then the Bible says your thinking must be cut off your hand. That's what Achan should have done rather than covet and take the accursed thing, the Babylonish garment and the silver and the gold, not literally cut off his hand, but the use of that hand through lust and covetousness should have been ruthlessly stopped. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. So that every one of you in the church should know how to possess his vessel, his body, including his hands, in sanctification and honour. Is this a sanctified, honourable use of my body and the members of it? Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. And your body belongs 
Here we go back to first principles. Very important thing to do in our thinking. Your body belongs to God. And if you're married, secondarily your body begins, belongs to your spouse. The opening verses of 1 Corinthians 7 make this clear. And thirdly, your body belongs to yourself. It certainly doesn't belong to your neighbor up the street. And the woman's body, or the girl's body, because men are much more prone to this sin of groping than others. The woman's body, particularly now thinking in church spheres, her body belongs to God. Because Jesus Christ bought her body by his blood on the cross. If the woman is married, her body belongs to her husband. And her body, of course, being her body, belongs to herself. And it doesn't belong to you in any shape or form. Therefore, hands off. And in this connection, 1 Thessalonians 4 brings up the whole idea of defrauding. So that no man goes beyond and overreaches and defrauds his brother in any manner, to whatever degree, taking something inappropriate, something you're not entitled to, something that doesn't belong to you. The defrauding here, especially in the text, first of all, is the husband of the woman. <coughs> that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. If this is a married woman, it doesn't belong to you. You have stolen her to whatever extent you've done something inappropriate and transgressed these borders from her husband. And if the woman is not married, you are defrauding her future husband, if she marries in the future. And since our bodies are not our own, you're sinning against Christ, the husband of the church. And then, of course, such activity, most obviously and most immediately, the woman, the girl, shock, a boundary has been transgressed. Something has gone beyond the person feels unclean even if they did nothing wrong because the body is significant. Human beings aren't just animals. When God does something in the conscience, the person feels traumatized, violated, boundaries broken, went beyond, defrauded, took something. And the evil source of this going beyond in all forms of sexual lust is the heart. And even the word rendered going be go beyond or overreach comes from a word which means greed, covetousness, and lust. In this instance, it's referring to sexual greed, sexual covetousness, and sexual lust. And the text says... Here's part of your sanctification, abstaining from fornication, verse 6, so that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter because that the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also have forewarned you and testified, God avenges. The avenger of sins against the seventh commandment. The avenger of sins here in the church. What doth the seventh commandment teach us? That all uncleanness is a curse of God. And that therefore, since it's this curse out there, we must with all our hearts detest the same and live chastely and temperately, whether in holy wedlock or in single life. And all of this brings us back to the key basic truths brought out in these sermons on the seventh commandment. You know who you are. I've been created male or female. I'm not confused. I'm not questioning. I'm not doubting. I'm not searching. I know who I am. And I know who I am in Jesus Christ. I've been redeemed with his blood on the cross. I'm a redeemed man or woman or child. 
And I know in what good state I am. I'm single with all the rules that apply to that. I'm married with all the guidelines and boundaries in that too. And I'm called, therefore, to obey the word of God, the clean, good way, and not the sexual immorality <coughs> of the world. And I live by faith. I live by faith through grace in Jesus Christ. I seek justification, the forgiveness of sins, and the reckoning of righteousness by faith alone for all my iniquities, including sins against the seventh commandment. And I seek in this Christ, who is a complete saviour, I seek also my <coughs> sanctification. Because when he died on the cross, I was in him, and I died to sin. I must reckon myself dead to sin. And I must believe in him too, to receive the power to break with iniquities, including sins <coughs> against this seventh commandment. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, grant to us grace, grace to confess our sins, grace to overcome and mortify them. And we pray, Lord God, that thou preserve us in our singleness and in our marriage without falling under this curse, and that thou keep us clean from such filth and enable us to walk in the light as thou art in the light with the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us from all sin. For we pray in his name. Amen. <clears throat>